For those that don't know me, I'm Anita Lumpkin, Dean of Students here at the Divinity School. And it is my job to open the ceremony with formal greetings, so greetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so delighted to see you all in the flesh and not just on my Zoom gallery. For as long as I have been here, all of four years, this community has gathered together to formally mark the beginning of the academic year. Of all the rituals and ceremonies steeped in education, I hold particular fondness for the annual Aims of Education gathering. The significance of us coming back together to say, hey, I still have questions, and I'm committed to exploring them with this community is rejuvenating to me. Our reconvening together marks our commitment to our collective journey and the exciting thing is, we have new folks at the table. New scholars, new leaders, new ministers who will enrich us and be enriched by us. At this time, I invite all new students, professors, teaching fellows to stand and be recognized. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is 
Jason Isaac Santana, as Anita mentioned, I'm a PhD student here at the Divinity School, very gratefully. Um, and I'm also speaking to you as the president of the DSA, uh, the Divinity Students Association. Uh, so first, before getting into um, my, uh, my reflections, uh, a matter of pure practicality uh, for DSA students, we're also coming upon the end of orientation social events. We have a dinner tonight at Promontory Point. I will be uh, walking over from the front of Swift Hall at 4.30 p.m. today, so please uh, see me there if you haven't been to the point yourself. Uh, next, I want to, for the 8,000th time this, uh, this week, congratulate our new students on what is already such a wonderful opportunity, wonderful success, um, a moment of great pride for you in your lives. Uh, but I also then want to welcome back everybody else who is uh, coming back to school, whose work is no less significant and should not be chased with any less enthusiasm uh, as that of our new students. So welcome back to all, and congratulations for being here. And as a follow-up comment on that gospel, uh, to <laughs> all of your uh, ventures in this year, uh, we know that it is difficult, but if we didn't know that, we wouldn't be here. Earlier this week, I was visiting with Dean Lumpkin, who asked me to say a few words here as DSA president. When I joked, so you won't be a sermon, uh, it was just an innocent bad joke that barely got a pity laugh, which I do appreciate. <laughs> but the next morning, she said, actually, uh, so here I am with a 45 minute sermon on the importance of paying your taxes. <laughs> Kid, I really have a reflection of sorts. And I think it's important uh, and appropriate to speak here as the TSA president to spend a bit of time talking about what it means to be a student. Several of you know uh, that my mom had me at 17 years old, but very few of you know the more extended story. After becoming pregnant with me at 16 years old, she was promptly removed from her high school honors program and then subsequently denied a scholarship that would have made college possible for her, what would have been first in my family's history. Instead, robbed and distraught and mostly disowned, she fell into a life of impoverished single motherhood. With all of the bad neighborhoods, drug dealers, seemingly sansaric cycles of abuse, and constant moving around included. I'll spare you further detail, but one could fairly say we had a hard time with it for many years. She was starved of a future because of this, yes. She was denied being first in her family's history to attend, uh, attend college at short. Even the smallest modicum of financial stability, much less career opportunity, was gone too. Working 60 hours a week, she ached in her bones and cried herself to sleep year after year just to barely provide food and shelter for her children. All those things she had ripped away from her, yes. But what hurt her most, and I remember this as a source of great pain for her in her youth, was being disinherited from the educational world. Sure, primary and secondary school aren't exactly the academy as we know it in at least a few significant senses, but they are in others. Even though life offered her very little by way of security or comfort, my mom is blessed, always has been, and I pray always will be, with an insatiable curiosity, an insistence that there is something more behind every little thing, a true, noble faith that the earth is not a cold, dead place. Her education, even at what I know myself to be clearly subpar, backward, podunk schools in the deserts of West Texas, was the grandest of opportunities in her eyes. Science, math, literature, history, in books, music, and TV, the world, and all its incomprehensible vibrance, was on full display. This little girl, often too afraid to return home because of the potential terrors that lurk there, could instead learn about hobbits and dragons, or that a falling apple carries within it the secrets of the universe for one who pays the precious price of attention. She could even make something beautiful herself with that old beaten up clarinet donated to her by a band director. She could journal about what it would be like to one day see the Colosseum in Rome. She could, at 17 years old, navigate what had become of her own tragic story through a strangely familiar character in the Scarlet Letter. The Academy was then for her place of refuge, comfort, welcome change, promise. Being abandoned by the academy was then for her, a tragedy that to this day she still roots. There was a time she remembers when her curiosity, her genuine passion to the 
unfold and engage the mysteries and beauties of all the world, bought for this little girl, born to nothing, absolutely everything. That was taken from her. She never really could capture again the types of opportunity necessary to do all she might have done, to see all she might have seen. But gladly, greatly, she did not lose her heart to this. Even still mourning all she would never experience, she graciously gifted that magical flicker in her eyes to her son. Maybe he could do things like that. Maybe his eyes could see one of the things. Even if she could not behold the world, the world still deserved those who hold them to. As you might never gather at this point, I consider the experience of a student that innate childlike inclination to wonder and to throw oneself into the world with innocent abandon, to be a kind of birthright. Specifically, I speak from the position of those born with very little other than themselves in the world. This inquisitiveness of what we call, or sorry, the inquisitiveness of what we call the student is a kind of inalienable power through which people can work to find something value here, something redeemed. And make no mistake, it is a brazenly courageous, some might even say foolish thing to do. Curiosity has a kind of faith as its basis. A general trust that the world is the kind of place worthy of exploration. To contemplate the stars and the soul, why we remember things, why we treat each other so badly, how we can do better, is the most vulnerable way possible to face what arguably seems to be the cruel indifference or even antagonism of reality. It is exactly that vulnerability and its relentless resilience in the face of balanced evidence and contrary that makes the work of the student so powerful. The student, in insisting that the world is more, that it is worthy of our best attention and efforts, is the one who makes this strange place a home. I can think of few holier vocations which is really just the polite academic way of saying there are not. <laughs> but there does come a close second, or perhaps more accurately, there comes a subsequent vocation, that of the teacher. I say subsequent for two reasons. The first is that the teacher, in his very existence, seems to implicate the student as a precondition. That is, there are no true teachers who have not been students first. Second, and perhaps more subtle, is that the experience of the student lends itself to the becoming of a teacher. Once one has seen the world through the wide eyes of the student, it seems almost incumbent to try to show others what you have seen, or more rightly said, to show others where to look. Some, something about the midnight epiphany, the birth and death of the day, the solace of a good conversation, seems like it must be shared. This is because I believe we know very, very more or less deeply in each of ourselves how difficult all of this really is. Because of that, we truly do wish to help make it better for others, too. So in addition to being a birthright, the prerogative of the student finds, as one of its discoveries, a great responsibility. To truly believe that the world is a place worth paying attention to, one must feel the call to serve as a kind of midwife of the truth as the great writer Charles Johnson once said. But in order to serve in that role, one must continually return to the dance of the mind, as that greatest writer Tony Morrison once said. She must commit herself, time and again, bruised and broken and discouraged, as the world will make us, to that intimate, sustained surrender, which is lending one's mind to another's, to all the things that our own minds are so blessed to call. So the student must become teacher, who must become student again, and round and round we go. So students and teachers of Swift Hall, of the University of Chicago, of our precious world, do not stop dancing. Insist that this place is worth all we can give. Refuse the great lies of apathy. Resurrect evermore that which makes us most human. To see a loveliness here worthy of greatest love. In the spring, while discussing the respective concepts and concerns of interiority and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, Professor William Schweiger stepped back from his Zoom camera. He's always leaning in uh, for the record uh, to the Zoom camera. He said something that struck me deeply, and especially so in a time of great need. 
Folks, we have to think clearly about this. This matters. What we're doing matters. We're talking about people's lives here. It does. Because we are. I hope one day to take my mother to all the places she's never seen. I hope one day to provide for her in such a way that she can study what she knows is most beautiful in the world. To read and to write and to speak and listen to her heart's infinite content. But please do not mistake me here. My mother already has all that a human being can ever have. Her life is already blessed. Each day she lives with that precious divine faith, a pearl of priceless value, knowing that the earth is not a cold, dead place. She's a student of the universe, a patron saint of the truest kind to we students of the university. So I raise my metaphorical glass to the student in each of us, to the best in each of us. May she live forever. And I leave you with this. Blessed are those with bright eyes. They know the truth of life as a matter of perfect laughter. Thank you. Welcome back to Slipknot.
I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else fails away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. It is our duty, our responsibility, 
our sacred church, to help our students become who they want to be, to help them become the best versions of themselves, to use a, a happy phrase for one that speaks so true uh, to the challenges of the time. To become the best teachers, the best scholars, the best ministers, religious leaders, the citizens of the university of the world. My grandfather was fond of saying, I want for you everything you wish for yourself, uh, which uh, captures very much what we as teachers should aspire to as well, but work very hard to help you achieve. We want for you to become exactly what you want to become, pushing you in many ways, challenging you. For the students and uh, the mirror image, I remind you that teaching and learning is always and constantly a cooperative adventure. Uh, so never stop helping us, never stop challenging us uh, to help you become the people you want to become. We work together forwards. A final thought. These have been and continue to be challenging times uh, to use the famous euphemism we live in interesting times. Remember uh, always throughout the year to take advantage of the opportunities we have, a really extraordinary opportunity. As we've learned well over the past few years, tomorrow is never promised, or I may end uh, with scripture. Um, who knows what the day will bring forth? Your day and I'll lay my day and I'll lay my day It is now my great honor to introduce our eminent convocation at convocation. Welcome, uh, ceremony speaker for today, Professor Sarah Hammerstein. Professor Hammerstein, Sarah okay, is, as you will soon be, uh, and perhaps appropriately reduced with every religious term I know, inshallah, imutish, and devilah, to God willing, karma permitting, as you will all soon be, uh, Sarah's a graduate of the Divinity School. She finished her MA and PhD here in Swift 12. Sarah is currently the professor, is currently the professor of religion and literature, the philosophy of religion, and the history of Judaism here in the Divinity School. College. She is also, as you well know over, from over the last few weeks, a, a leader in the, in the community. She is the director of master's education and she is the co chair of diversity and inclusion. You have encountered her many times over the last uh, few weeks and the many events and orientations. Uh, Sarah has published three books with a fourth soon to be hot off the press. Her first book, Figural Jew, The Figural Jew, was shortlisted for the AAR's uh, prize for best first book in history of religions. Her second book, Broken Tablets, explores in quite thorough and extraordinarily detailed uh, way the cultural, historical, intellectual background of the emergence of Derrida and Levinas as both well general philosophers and philosophers of Judaism. Her third book, uh, I must confess, being a medievalist with the finest resources is one of my favorite. Uh, an anthology of sources uh, from modern Jewish thought in France, something that had never been done, done previously. The fourth book, Hot Off the Press, soon to be, when is it coming up? In December? So 2021, soon to appear uh, at Amazon <laughs> Radio, <laughs> it is uh, entitled Devotion, a co author work with Constantine. Of the Indiana University in Amy Hollywood at Harvard. Um, Sarah's work focuses on the philosophy of Sarah Kaufman, Kaufman Kaufman, who is a lesser known figure in, in the Renaissance of Jewish thought in France in the 20th century. Professor Hammerschuk is giving our Aims of Education talk today, which she has entitled The Mystery of Encounter. So please join me in welcoming her.
and to Dean Berger, Berger for everything you do on such a daily basis to make this place just so organized and efficient and unique. Um, and to all the faculty and the students who came here, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a little bit of a PowerPoint because I have a couple of paintings to show. It's not super important, but we're just sure. So you're here. You're really here. I can't believe it. I'm sure like many of you before March 2020, I had no idea how tremendous, how epic it would feel, how grateful I would be simply to be able to say that. I say it now knowing how precarious this is, even risky, to be gathered together in this room on September 24th, 2021. And with the joy, the excitement of meeting new people and seeing friends and colleagues we haven't seen for 18 months, it's difficult not to wish that things were different. It's difficult not to wish that we were here without masks, without fear, and without risk. Nonetheless, there is something in all this precarity that can be clarified. Perhaps it can help us indeed to perceive more keenly the aims of our education. As some of you may already know, the Aims of Education Address is a University of Chicago institution. Since 1961, a faculty member has given an annual address to the incoming undergraduate class at the Rockefeller Chapel with the assignment of offering a new insight on this theme. While this is only the fourth year that we've included such an address in our own Divinity School of Convocation, our participation ties us to this greater tradition and it connects us to others who have gathered here in this particular space under these angels in years past. And to those who will gather, we hope, long after we're gone. As scholars of religion, it's not difficult for us to recognize this as the work, the enactment of a ritual that goes into forging tradition. 22 years ago, in 1999, I sat in this room for the first time. For my own orientation, I was 25, a first year master's student, and honestly scared to death, not about catching a virus, or about the state of the planet, or about our nation's divisive culture, fears we can all now add to the personal ones that stem from self-doubt, but scared, nonetheless. I was scared to be in a new city, to meet new people, but mostly I was scared that I wasn't smart enough, that I wouldn't measure up. I had not been a religion major as an undergraduate, and I was convinced that I was out of my guts and that it was only a matter of time before everyone around me figured that out as well. I tell you this in case you felt something similar, but more importantly, I tell you this because in the meantime, I've learned that the point of being here, the aim of education, does not actually lie in having others affirm us so that these fears are dispelled. I will say, without reservation, having met many of you, having read your work and your applications, that you are indeed smart enough to be here, smart enough to produce great scholarship and to make a contribution to the field, but that's not the point. The point is to find ways to turn outward towards others, because the aim of education is in the possibility, the thrill, the risk, the chance of the encounter with another in all of that entails. This is not to say that you will not be by yourself quite a bit while you're here, perhaps more than ever before in your life, staying late in the library, bent over a book, mastering a new language or discipline, or awake at home in your apartments when even the street traffic has been reduced to a hush. In front of your computer, your mind stirring with new thoughts and ideas. We put a lot of emphasis at this university on both mastery and innovation, on daring to think something new, to say something that has never been said before, or at the very least, to say it better. Perhaps the most daring thing I have to say today is that I think the aim of education lies elsewhere, not in mastery, but in openness and vulnerability to echo those who come before me in a lovely sort of synchronicity. Um, not only in innovation, but also in reception. But is it daring to say so? Well, as we've seen, perhaps not. Not in a divinity school. Perhaps not among people who study 
religious traditions. One of the reasons I came here in 1999 to study rabbinics and philosophy of religion was because I was so moved by the rabbi's interpretation of Deuteronomy 29.14. By the way they understand its last phrase, the eight asher enenuko iman hayom. The verse begins, the Lord God makes his covenant with those who are standing here, with us this day, and here's the key phrase, and with those who are not here this day. This phrase the rabbis understand to indicate, I'm quoting from Exodus Rabbah, is that the sages who were to rise in each and every generation, each and every one of them, also received at Sinai the wisdom he was to utter. At the time, I was fascinated by how such a teaching could accommodate innovation while grounding it in tradition, how this interpretation helped justify the rich and fruitful practice of commentary. What gets to me now, however, is something else. It's the emphasis on forging connection, constantly. What the poet Paul Salon in his 1960 address in Meridian calls responding. The poem Salon writes in this address, quote, is lonely. It is lonely and en route. Its author stays with it. Does this very fact not place the poem already here at its inception in the encounter, in the mystery of encounter? This is still a The poem intends another, needs this other, needs an opposite. It goes towards it, bespeaks it. For the poem, everything and everybody is a figure of this other towards which it is headed. What I love about these lines is how they stage the precarity of such an encounter, its risks and dangers. When I picture the poem and its reader, I do not see something static, and I do not imagine a text consumed or absorbed by its reader. Rather, the poem and the reader seek one another, head towards one another. Do they meet? We don't know. What does it mean for them to meet? The poem, he says, keeps its silences, its secrets, its site of origin from which it arose. It keeps those to itself. Salam says, quote, it is mindful of its date, but it speaks. All of us have our dates. The events that changed us, that marked us, and the singularity of those moments is by the very nature of the event not communicable. Like the poem, we are mindful of our dates. And yet we speak. The work you will do here at the Divinity School has its meaning in exactly that, in forging from the singular, the communicable. The date itself testifies to the structure. It bears its singularity like a scar. But when the date on the calendar circles back, we commemorate, we communicate. All scholarship participates in this ritual, a ritual we celebrate by gathering here today at the beginning of the school year. There's no fusion in this encounter, no meaning of the minds, but something much more fragile, a meridian, an act of constellation. For the constellating act is also an event, a new one, one that begins, Salon says, with the turning of the breath, the atom bender. That moment of strangeness when we read something that takes our breath away. This creates a new date. All of us, I imagine, commemorate these moments too, the moments when we read something or had a conversation in which the very strangeness of it, well, it, it altered us. And it wasn't at first about understanding. At first, we do not understand. And yet the moment itself is liberatory. It's not freeing in the sense that we feel empowered. It's something different, the freedom that comes from being unmoored. A freedom from what we thought we knew, from the familiar. That freedom is precarious because it is a freedom of the encounter with all the possibility of connection and all the risk of abandonment. These experiences, I hope, are why you are here. May they serve not just as the instigation of your education, but also its aim. And yet the risk involved, gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stay down. <laughs> is also something we shy away from. We work to put secure ground under our feet, to buttress ourselves with support beams that give us a sense of security. We adopt truisms that make us feel less at risk in the world, or sometimes 
we go on the offense, denigrate others to make ourselves feel more secure. This is the flip side of precarity. Think about that interaction you had the other day, you know, the one where you thought you were potentially about to have an exciting and interesting conversation, and then you realize the person you were talking to was actually marshalling all their defenses to keep the conversation on the territory, or he or she knew more. The one where you walk away thinking, wow, I must have like one brain cell. <laughs> or maybe you were on the other side of it, and maybe you walk away feeling smarter. You could, you could see on the other person's face that flicker of self-doubt. I am willing to bet if you're in this room, at one time or another, you've been on both sides of such an interaction. Recently, it's come home to me that such interactions don't just happen in the basement of Swift Hall while waiting for your coffee. It's come home to me that such patterns of behavior are equally endemic to the history of philosophy and the history of religion. All of them driven, I think, by the fear of being unmoored. In a small book by the philosopher Sarah Kaufman, entitled Comment sans sortir, or How to Escape, Kaufman writes, there is no doubt discontinuity between the various technical traps which men weave to protect themselves and the traps sophists set in their discourse to master their adversaries. No break between fishers, hunters, weavers, and sophists. Lest you conclude that the point here is to separate the philosopher from the sophist, Kaufman continues, the philosopher who tracks down the sophist beast and drives him from every lair in a pitiless pursuit is closely related to his prey. Might not the distinction itself, she suggests, be a part of the philosopher's effort at self-protection, a means to defend himself from accusation? It's Plato who says in the Republic that the aporias of discourse and thus the very activity of thinking can be as dangerous and frightening as the sea, and we must swim if we hope to reach the shore. The sophist, according to Plato, is the one who exploits these difficulties, introducing, I'm quoting Kaufman here, paraphrasing Plato, the sophist, duplicity, equivocity, tortuous and oblique ambiguity, end quote. And how must the philosopher defeat him? It's always a key, by the way, the female only appears as a trope for the traps themselves in these debates, which is one of Kaufman's points. Quote, he must outdo him by adopting his wiles. This, Kaufman suggests, is the very plot of Plato's dialogue, The Sophist, and I quote again. Two doubles, one good, one bad, they resemble each other like dog and wolf. The irony, of course, is that metaphor is the only means by which the philosopher can describe the battle for truth, even as it is the poet who is presented as a danger, the poet who often plays the part of Sophist. But if how we describe our pursuit of truth is only by metaphor. Must we live by metaphors that borrow from the battlefield? Must the goal of intellectual work always be put in terms of gaining ground? The moment we think in terms of offense and defense, don't we lose sight of the encounter? This was a question Sarah Kaufman asked throughout her life. Like Paul Salon, Kaufman was a Holocaust survivor. As a child, she spent the war in hiding and her father, a rabbi, Eric Kaufman, died in Auschwitz, pummeled by a shovel for refusing to work on Shabbat. She was thus no stranger to loss, to risk, no stranger to the desire for security. But what preoccupied her as an intellectual was how the compulsion to distract ourselves from our own fragility sometimes animates our pursuit for intellectual mastery. She makes this point most vividly in an essay published posthumously entitled Conjuring Death, Remarks on the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Toll. This is where my The title refers to Rembrandt's 1632 painting of an autopsy. Here the metaphors are not of the battlefield, but for Kaufman they are no less problematic. What interests her about the painting is the fact that in it the body appears almost forgotten. For the attention of all men is on the anatomy book at the foot of the bed. The body, as Kaufman puts it, could almost be a lecture. The scientific gaze replaces the corpse with a specimen, allowing us to forget that this decaying body was only days earlier walking around, a man trying like the doctors themselves to forget his own entrails. 
quote, they do not seem to identify with the cadaver stretched out there, she writes. They do not see in it the image of what they themselves will one day be, of what unbeknownst to them they are in the process of becoming. The desire to learn and to know is depicted here in the shared quality of attention. Luminous eyes turned to the light of truth. This concentration, this thirst for knowledge, transforms the fact of the body into something else, to a means of higher attainment. Even as the body lies there for us to see, the painting fails to show us the reality of a 17th century autopsy, with its stench and its mess. Kaufman thus supplies it in a footnote, supplementing the painting with a description from the Gay of Cain story of the autopsy. I'll share a few lines, only for the sake of contrast. They took their dissecting equipment out of the white cupboards, white boxes full of hammers, bone saws with strong teeth, files, gruesome forceps, small sets of giant needles like crooked vulture beaks forever screaming for flesh. Blood streaming over their hands, they delved ever deeper into the cold corpse and brought forth its insides like white cooks disemboweling. <laughs> Unlike the painting, the Hain story emphasizes the violence of the operation, the violence of the pursuit of knowledge. In the painting, the violence is, if anything, implied, even as the painting depicts the dissection of an arm. The focus of the subject, and thus the viewer, is elsewhere, on the capacity of knowledge to illuminate, to captivate. The likeness between the men and the body is hidden by their black robes. In their white colors, they almost seem like floating in. Science is here the means of transcendence. The painting is thus part and parcel of a long tradition, running from Socrates through Christianity to science. Kaufman herself compares the painting to Jordan's The Four Evangelists, which I'll show you as well. The book of science has merely replaced the Gospels, both providing illumination that dispels darkness. Of course, it would not be surprising let alone problematic, we might respond, to see this continuity as the virtue of civilization. Why shouldn't we prefer light and knowledge to dark and horror? But what if like the contrast between the painting of the autopsy and the story of the autopsy, the operation of truth-seeking, our desire for the consolation of that pristine combination of truth and originality, is not only driven by the impulse to look away Sorry. It's not only driven by the impulse to look away from the fact of our own entrails, from the fact that tomorrow it could be us lying on that table. What if the illumination, the promise of truth, the purity of which Socrates himself distinguishes in the fate of, from the material of the body, also conceals from us our own acts of violence? It's a question that seems all the more urgent at this moment as we round the bend in this country alone towards 700,000 deaths, over 225 million worldwide. It's a question I ask, knowing that some of you may have lost someone over the last 18 months, that at least you have felt the risk. The point I want to make here is that we can scurry to free ourselves or distract ourselves from the experience of risk, or we can recognize that living in the moment of precarity connects us to those who have come before, for study, whether humanistic, religious, or scientific, has never taken place far from the stench of death, even if the last 65 years in this country have sometimes given us that illusion. The reality we live now is, in fact, one that connects us to generations of those who also lived in precarious conditions, and thus to the very practices that have been used since time immemorial to make ourselves feel whole by rejecting the set of frailty onto others. Perhaps this connection to the past can help us. I say this not to endorse an uncritical or unthinking repetition of what has come before, or to counsel reverence towards the white men who wrote the foundational texts of our disciplines. I say it to suggest that even as we add new important voices to the conversation, it's not so easy to leave the old ones behind for the simple reason that their desires and fears may not be so different from our own, not only because our culture has been shaped by their discourses, but because we share with them the condition of mortality. Kaufman fascinates me as a thinker because despite her cogent critique of the history of philosophy, 
despite the fact that she often described it as though it were the story of men elbowing each other out of the way to declare themselves king of the hill, men who turned the world into a series of natural hierarchies so that knowledge and politics mirrored one another in a relationship that functioned to benefit those in charge, despite seeing this tendency and diagnosing it with the insight of a prophet, she read and commented on this tradition, the tradition of philosophy, with a kind of devotion. She unsettled it, she disrupted it, but she read it and wrote about it, penning a kind of commentary and seemed to reference the rabbinic tradition she associated with her own father. She wrote, most importantly, in a way that was attentive to her own mortality, to her own vulnerability. She wrote at such a pace that Jacques Derrida, a friend and interlocutor, once counseled her in a long letter from 1977 to slow down not to give in to the desire to divest herself of her thoughts so quickly, to let go of a need to produce with urgency a need, he suggested, they shared in common. She responded that in addition to this need, which she admitted they shared, she also wrote of love for others, for those she esteemed, to exist for those others. Without her writing, she confessed, she feared she would no longer be of interest, that she would disappear. She fascinates me because this is such a startling admission of vulnerability. It provides a depiction of the academic endeavor as one motivated by the desire for recognition, the hope for an encounter, and of the need to respond. All of us come here with these desires, hopes, and needs. They make us vulnerable and put us at risk, but they also create possibility. When Kaufman wrote that letter to Derrida, she did not know that I would one day read it. And I do not know what she was thinking when she wrote it. This is the case with her letter, which I found in an archive. It's also the case with the millions of books in the library. They were written not only for those who were alive that day, but also for those who are not yet. For each of those books, there was an author who did not know that you would be the one to pick it up. We are, each of us, a hinge between the past and the future, determining what will be remembered? What will be carried forward? In that very fact, there is possibility, mystery, and responsibility. When you write alone at your desk in the darkness, you bear this with you. You do not know who will someday read what you write, who will find in it something to which they must respond. In saying this, of course, I do not tell you something that you do not already know. If you are fascinated by what it means to be a part of a tradition, or for that matter, troubled by what it means, then you've already had such an encounter with something or someone that has the power to unmoor you. Whether that, per whether that other is a person you met, a poem, a sutra, a mystical meditation, or an argument for the existence of God. I don't mean to suggest that this potential commonality makes us all the same. I would not presume it. But I say it so that at the beginning of the school year, we might remind ourselves of the events that brought us here. And so that we might find in our common pursuits, in our shared endeavors, in our conversations, that breath turn, the moment of strangeness, of encounter. I'd like to include then with a few more lines from Salon's speech, which seem equally appropriate just short of 61 years later, on our September 24th to his October. I am also, since I, I am also, since I am again at my own point of departure, searching for my own place of origin. I am looking for all this with my imprecise because nervous finger on the map, a child's map, I must admit. None of these places can be found. They do not exist. But I know where they ought to exist, especially now. I find something else. Ladies and gentlemen, I find something that consoles me a bit for having walked this impossible road in your presence, the road of the impossible. I find the connective, which like the poem, leads to the counties. Thank you.
for praise for the things that you have just said before us. Thank you. Thank you for invoking the encounter. Thank you for embodying the encounter. And thank you for reminding us that encounter is both our means and our aim in this community. I'm grateful and blessed by what I just heard. Thanks to those speakers who've come before, to uh, our Dean of Students, Anita Lumpkin, who has set this table and keeps setting this table and keeps setting this table uh, since all of you submitted those first applications. Anita, we're grateful for all the ways that you minister to us. Um, and Nina has a special message for us, and that is food is coming. <laughs> We're almost at the end of our opening, the end of our beginning. Uh, there is food coming your way. The caterer is lost, apparently, but is on their way. So conclude, at the conclusion of this service, make your way slowly down to the outdoor courtyard. Keep an eye eagerly on the common room of the box. And when it arrives, enjoy your box with one another in that beautiful fall day that I'm sure the Dean of Students Office has ordered and has arrived on schedule on my computer. So thank you, Anita, for all you do. President Santana, thank you uh, for words from the heart that remind us where uh, thought and heart come together. Thank you for those words. Sarah Bigger for that of poem that invites us in and calls us out all at the same time. We are grateful. We are grateful, Dean Robinson, for all that you have done and all that you are about to do. We are glad, <laughs> we are glad that you are leading us. And to all of you, welcome. Welcome, or welcome back to Swift Hall. For so many of us, for so many different reasons, it's been a long, long journey to this room, to this day, to this moment. And so I invite you, before we close this ceremony and open the doors and head down to await our lunch, before we enter this cool, clear autumn day before we head later on to the sukkah or the weekend, to Monday, to the beginning of fall quarter at long, long last. <laughs> Just before all that, I invite you right now to stop and savor. I invite you to sit just where you are, feet on the floor, hands in the air. Engage where you are at this moment on the precipice of all that is to come. Take a few slow breaths and listen to the silence. This is what beginning sounds like. Upon whose shoulders we now stand, 
by his teachings, we were awakened, whose words pointed us to this break, to this beginning. For all of us, I hope, the silence brings us face to face with the holy inevitable, but also entirely enviable, unknowing. The unknowing that is what it means to be at the brink of beginning. Constitutively, human beings are well acquainted with this place of unknowing. We are finite creatures who cannot ultimately know fully we, well, we are at the same time fully human. But being human, we also avoid this place of unknowing assiduously. It is uncomfortable, it is uncool, and in the estimation of some, it is unfaithful or irresponsible not to know, or not to pretend to know. <laughs> At the same time, history far and history near reminds us time and again that our refusal to acknowledge what we do not know is dangerous. That our willingness, our unwillingness to own our humanness and with it our humility is destructive. And that the curiosity born of unknowing that is, our desire and our eagerness to learn is essential, not simply for human flourishing, but for the, human, the flourishing of all creation. Our parents, our caregivers, recognize something of the power and promise at the brink of beginnings, this precious gift of our own unknowing, when they took photos of our anxious and eager faces and kept these snapshots of hope, hopefulness like holy relics. And they filled the anxious silence before our very first day of school as we stood at the front door with aphorisms and instructions, mundane and profane. In the doorways of my childhood, my mother recited her own litany on the brink of each school year's beginning. She said, take care, learn something new, remember whose you are. Mm -hmm. My mother was a child of immigrants and entirely unimpressed by individualism. You notice she did not say remember who you are. <laughs> she said remember whose, remember whose you are. By these three instructions she meant Look both ways before you cross the street. Don't tell the teacher, as I was wont to do as a very small child, that you already know that. <laughs> I was maybe precocious, but I was actually really just, I abhor the idea of not knowing. <laughs> and don't embarrass your family. As, true, as is true of many litanies, my mother's words were more true than she could possibly know. And so in the doorways of my own children's childhood, I recited the litany anew. Take care. Learn something new. Remember whose you are. They were minister's kids in a small town, after all. They were doomed to be examples and scapegoats for all manner of other adults' anxieties. Remember whose you are. <laughs> My youngest, easier, eager to follow her oldest siblings out the door, would repeat the mantra at the ripe old age of three. But in her colorful mind, learn something new became learn something blue. <laughs> a blessing that we still invoke in my household to this day when the meaning in a moment feels particularly elusive. <laughs> learn something blue. And so on the brink, friends, of our new beginning this day and in this place as we stand in yet another doorway, I invite you to receive these words of blessing, maybe refashion them as your own colorful minds see fit, and repeat them in your coming and your going uh, when you leave your home 
when you come through those doorways uh, at the entrance of Swift Hall, remember to take care. Take care of your own tender unknowing. Tend and attend to that unknowing. And tend and attend as well to the humanity and the humility of your colleagues and your companions. Learn something new. And welcome the strangeness of knowledge that comes from every age, from every corner of the globe, from every manner of creature. And when all else fails, learn something blue. <laughs> and remember whose you are. You did not come here alone. You did not work here alone. You've been given to one another. And the knowledge you gain is never gained only by you, only by us, nor only for you, nor only for us. Take care. Learn something new. Remember whose you are. And trust as well that lunch is always on its way. <laughs>